Thank you, Bill. Well, good evening. I invite you to uh, take your Bibles and find 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. There's a chance we'll finish up this little book, this little letter this evening as we have continued to walk together through the, these little writings of, of Peter. While you're turning there, just by way of reminder, as we have focused on 2 Peter over the past few weeks, we've discussed several things, distinctives of the letter, features of the letter, themes of the letter. And we have seen, as we've talked about some of those things, that the primary focus of 2 Peter is what? Spiritual growth. I mean, he begins the letter talking about growth. He ends the letter. The very last verse of the letter says, but grow. And so kind of a focus is spiritual growth. But we have also identified some other issues. Like last week, we talked about false prophets. So apparently in the area where the believers lived, false prophets had come in and were beginning to teach false doctrine. And so in an attempt to help the believers in the area, Peter wrote a whole chapter and confronted and helped the believers think about these false prophets. But he also took a, another step and he, in a sense, spoke to the false prophets themselves and talked about the judgment that awaits them for what they were teaching and what they were saying and how they were taken away from, from the Lord Jesus and the things that they were doing. And then tonight, as we finish chapter 3, part of what we're going to see is the final or the other issue that apparently had surfaced in the area where these believers lived. And what was that? Well, it has actually to do with the second coming of the Lord. And so what I would like to do is maybe read the first uh, 10 verses of 2 Peter chapter 3, and then we'll begin to talk about some of the things that Peter addresses as he writes this last chapter. So 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter says this, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own desires or lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now, I didn't read the rest of the chapter, but when you consider the 18 verses that comprise this third chapter, and you think about what Peter is uh, doing as he seeks to close the letter, there are three concepts that he tries to leave with the believers in this last chapter. The first concept comes in just the first two verses. He just comes right out and says, well, here's my purpose in writing. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. 
secondly, from verses 3 all the way down through verse 13, he talks about this other issue, the Lord's return. And as you heard me read a moment ago, apparently people were mocking the believers because they believed Jesus was going to come back. And so Peter seeks to help the believers in that day think through what's being said and what the, what the truth is and what, what the Word says. And then lastly, from verses 14 through 18, there's a conclusion, and we didn't read that far, but we might get to, to that this evening. And when we do, we'll, we'll look at those verses, but Peter seeks to conclude the letter with a couple of final statements. So let's go back to the first concept, his purpose. In verses 1 and 2, Peter's very explicit about what his purpose is. I mean, he tells them in verse 1, now this is the second time I have written you, or actually I am writing you, because when he was writing this, he was in the process of writing, right? Uh, so he is writing, yes. So he's in the process of writing them. Now here's what he says <clears throat> there in verse 1. The second time I'm writing you to do what? Stir up your mind by way of reminder. So what's interesting to me about this is this is the way the letter began. If you go back to chapter 1 and look at verses 12 through 15. Now we won't read all four verses there but three times in those four verses Peter uses the word remind reminder or call to mind and so as Peter begins the letter he says to them as he writes with a sense of urgency I want to leave some things with you he tells them I know my time is short on this earth and because of that, there are certain things I want to impress upon you. And he says in verse 12, so I want you to be able to, I want to remind you. In verse 13, he says, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. Verse 15, after I'm gone, I want you to be able to remember these things. So the letter begins with a note of what? Stirring them up by way of reminder. And now, as you move to the end of the letter, the very last chapter, Peter says, well, this is the second time I've written. I'm trying to remind you of some things, and I want to stir you up by way of reminder. And so he wants them to remember what? Well, that's what verse 2 says. Remember the words, plural, spoken beforehand by the holy prophets. By the way, what was the Bible in Peter's day? The Old Testament. And so he wants them to remember what? The words spoken beforehand by whom? The holy prophets. And the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. And so there's certain things Peter wants them to remember. So again, he says, I want you to remember these things. I want you to be able to recall them. And I'm wanting to remind you of the things spoken in the Word, the, the, the Old Testament, the prophets, and things spoken by Jesus, which had been what, as he says in verse 2, spoken by your apostles. So not only the Old Testament, but the things Jesus spoke that were being taught by the apostles. So his purpose is very simply to remind them of some things. By the way, a reminder is not a bad thing from time to time, is it? <clears throat> I mean, how many of us need reminders on a daily basis? Uh, oh, absolutely. I was talking to somebody today, and I said, you know, I had something pop in my head earlier this morning, and I should have written it down and put it with about six other Post-it notes I have on my desk <laughs> of things I need to remind myself of. <clears throat> and so reminders are not bad things. And so that's what Peter's saying. Here's my purpose to remind you of these things. Okay, secondly, not only his purpose in writing, but the issue related to the Lord's return. So, the believers are being mocked, they're being ridiculed, because they hold to a belief that Jesus will come again. And so, Peter, beginning in verse 3, 
recognizes that and begins in this portion of this chapter to try to help them think through what's being said and what they need to remember. So in verse 3, what does he say? Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. So we've talked about this on other occasions. Paul has words for believers in his day about things that will take place in the last days. Jesus himself, as he talked about the last days, had words for his followers. And so Peter says in the last days, this shouldn't surprise you, this is going to happen. People will be making fun of you. They'll mock you for your beliefs related to Christianity. Now, that probably won't happen here in America. Okay, so I can't even get through that without chuckling. Uh, yeah, as days come closer to the Lord's return, believers will be mocked for our faith, our convictions, our beliefs, our stands on the Word of God. And Peter says to the believers in his day, look, they're going to mock you. And in Peter's day, the specific issue was the return of the Lord. I mean, what is it they say in verse 4? Well, the bottom line is, they're, they're saying this, well, where is he? You guys keep talking about him returning. Where is he? Where is the promise of his coming? Because ever since the fathers fell asleep, well, everything just c continues like it was from the beginning. And so the, the mocking, the ridicule, you guys believe he's coming. Well, where is he? Where is he? Everything just kind of keeps going on like it always has. Where's the promise of his coming? And boy, when I, I thought about that, I was reminded of the words of the Lord Jesus. So if you hold your finger in 2 Peter so you don't lose your place there and go back to Matthew chapter 24 for a moment. Let me just read a couple of verses from Matthew 24. Words from the Lord himself as he spoke about his return. So in Matthew 24, in verses 4 and 5, Jesus says this to his disciples. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, meaning the disciples, See to it that no one, what? Misleads you. Now look at the next verse. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ and will mislead many. Come on down a little bit further. Look at verses 23 through 25. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here's the Christ, or, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, Jesus says, I have told you in advance. And so in, in the days of Jesus, he said to his followers, of whom Peter was one, and Peter was there on that occasion in Matthew 24, listening to the words of Jesus. And Jesus said to his followers then, don't be misled, don't be fooled. There are going to be people that rise up and say, oh, I'm, I'm him. For other people, false prophets will say, no, he's over here. No, no, the, the Christ is over there. And Jesus says, don't be misled in the days that approach his return. Well, Peter says, in addition to what Jesus says, Peter says to the believers in his day that you're going to be made fun of because you believe he's coming, that he will return. So, as Peter uh, begins to address this issue of them being made fun of, of them being mocked, he says, I know this is what's being said. People are kidding you, mocking you about the return of the Lord. But now Peter says there's something these mockers don't realize. <clears throat> Come back to 2 Peter chapter 3 now. Now at the end of verse 4, Peter says part of the ridicule is these mockers say, well, where is he? Where's the promise of his coming? 
the end of verse 4, man, e ever since our fathers fell asleep, everything just continues as it was. Everything just kind of goes on as it has gone on. But now look at the beginning of verse 5. For when they say this, or when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. See, there's, there, there's something the mockers don't realize. They, they continue making this statement. And they just say, well, everything stays the same. They maintain this. And Peter says, but there's something that escapes their notice. Well, what is it that escapes their notice? Well, in verses 4, 5, and 6, Peter reminds them things are not the same. In fact, Peter says that just as the world was judged once in the days of Noah through the flood, there's a second judgment coming. But it'll be different. It'll be through what this time? Fire, extreme heat, Peter says later in the chapter. And so these guys, the mockers, are just proclaiming, well, Jesus isn't coming. I mean, where is he? You guys keep talking about it. Where is he? Everything's just remaining the same. And Peter says, no, it's not the same. They maintain that, but this escapes their notice. And boy, again, when I was preparing for tonight and thinking about this passage, I was reminded of the words in Jesus back in Matthew 24. And back in Matthew 24, Jesus said, in the days that get near to his return, people will be marrying and giving in marriage and just things will go on just like nothing has changed what Peter's saying here and things will for for unbelievers particularly things will just kind of be like they are and Paul and Peter here says when Jesus returns for unbelievers it'll be like a thief in the night they won't suspect it because they maintain what well nothing's changing nothing's happening and so they're not looking for it, not expecting it. And so it'll be like a thief coming in the night. So the ridicule is based on the belief the believers have in the return of the Lord. They believe Jesus is going to return. The mockers are like, well, where is it? And Peter says, well, they maintain that, but something escapes their notice. And so he addresses that. But then, to help the believers, not only does he talk about the mockers, he says to the believers, now there's something you guys need to remember too. And I love this, because Peter helps adjust their mindset in the face of the ridicule and in the face of the mocking. So what is it Peter says to them? Well, look at verse 8 again. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. So the mockers, something escapes their notice. But Peter says to the believers, do not let this escape your notice. Well, what is it? Beloved, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Well, so what's the bottom line? Well, God doesn't keep time like I do. God doesn't keep time like we do. Absolutely not. And sometimes we think something has been delayed or we think, oh my goodness, I've, I've waited for, you know, I've been praying about this and praying about this and agonizing in prayer about this and I've been praying and, you know, five minutes have gone by and I don't have an answer. <laughs> Man, Peter says, listen, remember, you believers remember, God doesn't keep time like we do. Man, for him, sitting in eternity on his throne, one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like one day. So God doesn't keep time like we keep time. Now, why is that important? Well, that's where verse 9 comes in. Again, in the face of being mocked for holding on to something that does not seem to be happening. Now, verse 9 comes in to help us. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness I don't know about you but after about 500 years I'm thinking that's kind of slow <laughs> been waiting a long time 
And Peter says, uh-uh, God doesn't keep time like we do. And God's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Why? Well, he doesn't keep time like we do. And so what might seem slow to us is absolutely just right on time for him. And so he's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. But he is patient toward you. So Peter reminds them, God's not slow, and he's patient towards you. Well, I want you to know I'm grateful for that part of that verse, that God's patient towards me. Uh, he's not slow, hallelujah, but he's patient with me for hallelujahs, uh, for his patience. He's, uh, he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So Peter reminds them, God's time frame is different than ours, and because of that, God's not slow keeping his promise. In fact, Peter says, part of what seems like a delay on God's part is his grace, because he doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And so he's not slow, as some count slowness. So what is it believers need to remember as they are made fun of, as they're ridiculed? They need to remember that time is different for God. They need to remember he keeps his promise. And they also need to remember a third thing. It's right in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. There's the affirmation. It's coming. You may be ridiculed, you may be made fun of, but that day is coming. And Peter reminds us here too, it comes how? Like a thief. So, as he seeks to help the believers in that day wrestle with and, and, and address the ridicule that they face, he reminds them of certain things. What's he remind them of? God doesn't keep time like we keep time. Remember that some Sunday morning when I'm preaching past 12. <laughs> oh, I, I, I thought that was funny. Uh, God doesn't keep time like we keep time. God keeps his promise. And that day's coming. And we can count on those three things. And that's what Peter says to be the believers in the face of the ridicule. You remember those three things. But he goes on. And so in verses 11 through 13, Peter mentions briefly this concept. Knowing that Jesus will return should have some impact in our life. What should that be? Well, look at verse 11. I didn't read this a moment ago. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. Look at the first part of verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So Peter says, knowing that things are going to turn out like they turn out should have an effect on how I live today. And Peter reminds the believers as they look to the day of the Lord, as they wait on the return of Jesus, that what? Verse 11, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, they should live in holy conduct and godliness, and they should look for that day. They should be looking for that day. And so now, after mentioning that, Peter moves to conclude the letter. And so let me read verses 14 through 18, and we'll go ahead and finish up the, the, the letter this evening. Peter says this, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. <laughs> 
I always chuckle, I'm sorry. When I, when I read that verse, I just kind of chuckle because it occurs to me, even Peter had trouble understanding Paul. <laughs> you ever read any of Paul's letters and think, man, I just don't get that passage. Well, you're in good company because I'm sure Peter, sitting on a boat in the Sea of Galilee, reading Paul's letters, just kind of scratch his head sometimes thinking, man, I just don't get that. And so Peter says, um, some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, as he concludes the letter, he has two thoughts he tries to impress upon them at this moment. What are those two thoughts? Number one, he wants them to have right thinking or to, to think clearly. Now, he's already been talking about that, right? He wants them to have right thinking about the return of the Lord. So they're being made fun of. They're being ridiculed. So Peter says, hey, remember this, remember this, remember this. And so now as he moves to conclude the letter, he wants them to think clearly in a couple of ways. What are those ways? Well, first, in verse 14, he says, since you're looking towards these things, do what? Be diligent to be found by him. Be diligent to be found by him. And so Peter says, in other words, since you're looking for his return, since you know that day will come, be diligent to be found by him. And then he gives three characteristics of how we should be found by him. What are those three phrases that describe how we're to be found by him? Well, they're in verse 14. Be found by him, what? In peace. We talked a little bit about peace Sunday night, didn't we? Looking at the life of Daniel and thinking about what it means to, to, to know peace when circumstances change and to know peace when things get difficult and to, to know that we can have peace uh, when the lions are hungry. Uh, thinking about what we looked at Sunday evening. And Peter says, as you think about the return of the Lord, when he appears, be found in him in peace. Secondly, be found spotless. Thirdly, be found blameless. And so, in essence, Peter is saying, don't be doing anything you wouldn't want to be doing if Jesus showed up and caught you. So in other words, as you're looking to his return, as you're waiting for his return, be diligent to be found in him in these ways, in peace, spotless, and blameless. So he wants them to have that mindset. And then he addresses the issue of the time frame again. You know, the, the mockers. Where is the Lord? Where is he? You keep talking about him coming. And, and notice what Peter says in verse 15. Regard the patience of the Lord as what? Salvation. Well, that, that idea has already been touched on. We read it up in verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So he's talking about salvation. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance, all to come to salvation. And so Peter reminds them here, yeah, the Lord's patient. Regard that as salvation. And then the final thing Peter mentions here in verses 17 and 18 is simply this. Don't be tricked. I read to you some verses from Matthew 24 a moment ago. Jesus says, don't be deceived. Here, Peter says, don't be tricked. Look at verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Peter says, I'm telling you, up front, before, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that what? 
You're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. So don't be fooled. Don't let these mockers throw you off. Don't let them hinder your walk with the Lord. Certainly, as the end of verse 17 says, don't let the unbelievers do what? Cause you to fall from your own steadfastness in your walk with the Lord. Stay steadfast. Hold to your convictions. That day's coming. God doesn't keep time like we keep time. And God certainly is not slow to keep his promise. And so the passage ends, the, the letter actually ends with, with that thought in verse 18, grow, but grow. So again, there's kind of the, the theme for the, the little letter itself. It begins in chapter 1, talking about spiritual growth. It ends here, talking about growth. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be carried away by those errors and those heresies, but instead of that, Hold on to your steadfastness, hold on to your convictions, and grow. Well, we've got a few moments. That finishes up uh, 2 Peter this evening. So if you have a, a, a thought or a question, uh, we can take one or two of those before choir practice, Brother Ron. Okay. Yes, ma'am, Francis. Francis.